So we have a couple more viruses to chat about, really. So the first one is hepatitis C. Okay. So it's a pretty interesting story. Well, first of all, hepatitis C turns out belongs to the same family as flaviviruses that we were just talking about. Okay. It's also positive single strand RNA virus. Very similar structure. Okay. Now there are multiple genotypes of hepatitis C, several subtypes among those genotypes. Uh, it's not a big virus. The size of the genome is 9,000 base pairs. The particle size is something like 30 to 40 nanometers. Um, now, it's kind of interesting story since it's positive strand RNA virus. When hepatitis C enters the cell, as many other positive strand RNA viruses, its RNA is translated immediately, like a huge, ginormous protein. And then the cellular enzymes cut it in appropriate pieces, which shows you, you know, a bit of coevolution between the virus and the host. Um, now, there are some receptors like protoglycan, heparin sulfate protoglycan, CD81, and scavenger receptor. So all these three receptors are required for the entry of hepatitis C in the cell. Now, it turns out that combination of these receptors can be found only in the human liver, which makes hepatitis C terribly hard to work with. Does that make sense? If you will take hepatitis C and will try to infect a mouse, it's not going to work. As far as I remember, you can infect monkeys. But you can imagine that monkeys, especially if you want to recapitulate this infection as close as possible, we're talking about human-like primates, we're talking about apes. There are a lot of ethical problems and price problems associated with the monkey work. We clear? So working with hepatitis C for a very long time was very problematic. People used, for instance, one of the models that was used was pretty wacky. So folks would take a chunk of a human liver, well, for a deceased person, and transplant it into skid mouse. Remember we talked um, about immune deficiencies? There are genetically modified mice that do not have T or B cell response. Severe combined immunodeficiency. Makes sense, right? So the skid mice, they severely immunodeficient, and they do not reject the transplant. So we'll put a chunk of human liver into a mouse to infect the mouse then with hepatitis C. So hepatitis C would infect that chunk of a human liver. That is pretty artificial model, as you can imagine. So, again, working with this virus was hard. There was, and still there is, no convenient cell culture system, okay? Take flavivirus, one of the best, West Nile. West Nile virus is often referred to be the most promiscuous virus that we know. It infects, like, anything. Yeah, you can take any human cell type, epithelial cells, fibroblasts, dendritic cells, macrophages, neurons, seriously, anything. And all you need to do is to, if these cells can grow in culture, like on the surface, you add West Nile, infection. No, it's nothing, just add virus. You take fish cells, add West Nile, infection. Canine cells, hamster cells, snake cells, infection. It infects anything, okay? So... Which means that it's really easy to grow virus in a vast amount. Does that make sense? All you need to do is just infect a bunch of cells and collect it. There you go. You can use the virus that you accumulated 
for studies, for vaccine production, for all these experiments. But Hep C, it's hard. The, there were some, some cell culture models that allowed you to produce some hepatitis C, but not a lot. So there was no way to industrially accumulate the amount of hepatitis C virus sufficient to produce a vaccine. We still don't have a vaccine against this virus. And that's a pretty considerable human pathogen. Now, I had a lot of pretty weird statistics, just it's, it was hard to read statistics about the hepatitis C in the United States. Now, that was, that was a, a sort of a, an easy part in this image. So, reported number of acute cases in the U.S. till 2015. So, there's a bit of a rise. It's 2,300-something cases in 2015. Okay. The reports that I read associate that elevation with um, increased use of injectable drugs. Okay, we have an opioid crisis going on, so people use needles and probably hair needles. Make sense? So that would explain. Now, hepatitis C is often presented as being sexually transmitted. Several pretty rigorous studies of one of them I, I remember kind of vaguely the design. So the idea was you have it was the, the study was focused on couples where one partner was hepatitis C positive and another partner was hepatitis C negative. Because I mean you cannot legally force humans to mate at your deliberation. So in these couples, they looked at basically the rates of hepatitis C transmission from person to person. And they found that sexual transmission is very infrequent. In all hepatitis C cases, it accounts for about 1%. And think about how many people have sex and how many people inject drugs, you know. So basically, that question on... The questionnaire for blood donation, have you ever lived with a person who has hepatitis C? I mean, there is a risk. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it, but it's actually minimal. Does that make sense? Now, why was so much concerned about hepatitis C? The infection, original infection, often goes asymptomatic. It can manifest it's the mild... Um, hepatitis, but then kind of goes away. Does that make sense? And the virus can lie dormant or replicate very slowly. I mean, technically, it's not a true latency. Virus does replicate in the liver, but replicates very slowly. It's a chronic infection, and it causes liver inflammation. Initially low-grade and then kind of increases. Chronic inflammation of the liver leads to the condition known as cirrhosis, which is a fibrotic changes in the liver when proper liver tissue is replaced with the connective tissue. Moreover, chronic inflammation, in many cases, not only in the case of hepatitis C, is associated with cancer. So the association between the liver sarcoma and hepatitis C infection is pretty well established. So this is one of the consequences. I don't have that breakdown here, but if you would look at the distribution of, no, I don't. So if you would look at the distribution of, let me see. No, I don't. I used to have it somewhere. So certain percentage of folk I believe about 20 to 25 percent of people who get infected with hepatitis C, they clear the virus. Does that make sense? Like you get common cold and then it's gone. No treatment, nothing, just clear the virus. Makes sense. Another 20 something percent develops cirrhosis. Another some percent develop 
some kind of liver failure or some other advanced stage liver disease. And then there is a proportion of folk who actually develop liver cancer. So not every person who will get infected will develop cancer or cirrhosis or there's going to be different stages. Does that make sense? Not in everybody it will progress all the way to cancer. So this virus, especially considering the blood-borne transmission, now we don't see transmission with the blood transfusions. It's mainly the needle sharing and where else? Tattoo salon. If the tattoo needles are not properly sterilized, the main source of hepatitis B and hepatitis, one of the main sources of hep B and hep C transmission in the U.S. is tattoo salons. Because that's basically the needle stick. Anyway, that was a concern. And scientists looked very closely into the possible ways to treat this infection. Again, I, I basically have a, a designed virology course which goes in a very much depth about certain viral pathogens. I don't have one, and I removed some of the um, stories, but basically the idea was to inhibit two key enzymes that are necessary for hepatitis C replication. And Gilead Biosciences <clears throat> managed to successfully develop the inhibitors of these two enzymes that we now know as cefosbuvir um, and I think Abvi uh, developed oh yeah the names just break my tongue Ledipasvir is an inhibitor of a different uh, enzyme. Does that make sense? So you have two enzymes, and drugs are targeting the function of these enzymes. So when Gilead announced the release of Sofosbuvir on the market, it was a major breakthrough. Its market shares skyrocketed. Just a great day for Gilead owners. Um, and here's the efficiency of treatment. Look at this. The original treatment of hepatitis C was with interferon, which sucked. Only about 10% of treated recovered. Then interferon was mixed with antiviral drug called rebavirin. It's the inhibitor of RNA synthesis. About a quarter of folks that were treated recovered. Then interferon was mixed with polyethylene glycol, which increased the efficiency of it. We started to talk about 50%. Then first protease inhibitor was introduced, and when it was combined with interferon, rebarberin, the efficiency went to 70%. It was pretty good, 2011, but not ideal. I still remember when Gilead announced its inhibitor, the cure rate was 99.9%. .9%, and it remains like this till now. You may notice that many treatments here are combination treatments. Does that make sense? So the virus does not develop the resistance. The conservative estimates is that the current treatments can cure up to 95% of folks. Although if you would look at the smaller scale studies, in some studies the reported curative rate is like 99.9% .9 really. So those drugs are insanely efficient. Does that make sense? And this creates a paradoxical situation. Since we now know which enzymes to target, the development of inhibitors becomes largely a technical issue. There are libraries of compounds 
that scientists can screen and identify the ones that actually inhibit the the target enzyme. That makes sense. Just it's it's basically a routine work for identifying the inhibitors and if they are not toxic, if they are efficient, there you go, you've got yourself a new drug. So you can put new drugs on the market fairly regularly. That creates a paradoxical situation that nobody works on Hep C vaccine anymore. The reason for it, hepatitis C is entirely human infection. So if we treat every infected person with antiviral drugs long enough, we can eradicate hepatitis C. One of the leading researchers in um, that field, Dr. Charles Rice, uh, he actually, I think he received a Lasker Award, which is like a noble in medical field, kind of, sort of, you know, alternative to Nobel Prize. So Charles Rice, in his interview, said that most likely what's going to happen, um, we're going to eradicate hepatitis C if we will be able to bring prices down. Now, when I first saw the cost, I was pretty shocking. Okay. 12 weeks for like seventy, eighty thousand dollars so One week is what? For this one, for Safasbuvir, 84000 for 12 weeks. It means $7,000 a week. Um, so daily course is 1000 bucks. How about that? Um, now, what's the reason for it? So pharmaceutical companies, of course, they have to compensate for all the research costs that they incurred and all the research failures that will never be published, you know, will never see the light of the day. But you have to appreciate that there is, you have to take the statements, oh, we charge for this drug so much because we need to, you know, return on our investments. You need to take it with a grain of salt. Because Charles Rice, one of the folks that was at the beginning of anti-hepatitis C treatments, where do you think he works? It doesn't work for Gilead Pharmaceuticals. He works for Rockefeller University. And where does he get money for his research? Not only from Gilead, from NIH and other funding agencies. So government actually sponsors a lot of these research activities. I'm not saying that we should stop it. I'm just saying, you know, pharmaceutical companies are not 100% sincere when they say, oh, we spent like $2 billion. Yeah, you did spend $2 billion, but there were other $500 million spent over the span of 20 years by the government, you know, on this research. By the way, there was some study showing the long-term return on investment for every dollar that National Institutes of Health put into grants. $23 per dollar. That's the return on investment. So each dollar invested in the research generates 23 bucks of profit. Indirectly through patents and licensing and developing of new drugs, but that's it's pretty convincing. Now, um, the last virus that I want to chat about is the norovirus. Why? The, the picture? The picture is great. It's not, uh, technically I can be sued for it because there's copyright on it, but I don't think anybody will. I couldn't find a free one and my drawing capacity is terrible. Okay, so yeah, that's the best description. It's two bucket disease. Um, Non-envelope positive strand RNA virus. So this is a functional virus, sorry. with iposahedral capsid and the RNA inside. And it also can produce so-called um, defective particles. Okay? Does that make sense? Particles that do not package any RNA 
but still can cause the immune response. Often, this virus is referred to as stomach flu. There is no such thing as stomach flu. Stomach virus, stomach bug, sure, but it's not a flu. Influenza does not cause gastrointestinal symptoms. Symptoms are pretty straightforward. Vomiting and diarrhea for 24 to 48 hours. That's it. Nothing more. Um, very genetically diverse, which tells you that if you get infected with one of those, later, like a month later, you can be infected with another. And you will have no immunity against the different genotype or serotype. Okay. Fecal oral transmission. I don't have the data here on the transmission, but you would say, oh, it's probably food preparation areas. And you would be wrong. The main sites of transmission of norovirus are nursing homes and schools. Okay. Places where hygiene is often either questionable or hard to maintain. Uh, there is a certain association with restaurants. In terms of food, if my memory serves me well, the main source of foodborne transmission, seafood. And then I believe it's leafy vegetables. Okay? So, if you think about this, the virus is actually perfectly adapted to survive in the human population. Because when somebody has profuse diarrhea and vomiting, the aerosolized vomitus or aerosol from flushing the toilet will land on virtually everything, okay? And then there is basic contamination of food or utensils because the infectious dose is really low. It can be as low as aid in particles and the concentration of the virus in pieces can be extremely high. On top of that, virus can be spread by asymptomatic carriers. There is asymptomatic infection. Virus can be spread during incubation period. And virus can be spread during convalescent periods. It was actually shown that a person who recovers from norovirus disease can spread the virus for another about six weeks. Okay. Now, how low the infectious dose? I'm going to tell you, I don't remember if I told you this story, but it's, it's a very gross story. But it shows you how low the infectious disease is. So on one college campus, um, I believe it was not disclosed which one, but it's a true story. I guarantee that there was a party and the party involved chili cookout well not like competition just a huge pot of chili okay so it was prepared and it was waiting for the party the next day and the guy who felt like he was I don't know he felt some pressure I don't know uh, being bullied by the peers he decided to spoil the party, quite literally, and he pooped in the pot of chili. And, yes, you indeed. And, well, the pot is, was pretty large, and chili was pretty spicy, so I believe nobody noticed, because he mixed it well. And he had, he had asymptomatically, he was asymptomatically infected with norovirus. So he didn't just spoil the party a lot of people almost spoiled the pants after the party because there were like several hundred people who tried this chili they all got infected so you can imagine how low the infectious dose despite of all the dilution they've got the infectious dose and they got sick uh, by the way that dude was an idiot he didn't realize that in the room where there was a that pot there were cameras yeah yeah, he got he got caught on cameras, and um, I believe criminal charges were eventually dropped. He was definitely expelled. 
Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe, but um, so so. But um, that kind of shows you. So this graph shows you the number of cases. Uh, the green one represents 2015-16, the red one 16-17. The take-home message from that graph, you can see that the peak number of cases happens around, you know, in January, February. Still have no idea why. Uh, seriously, maybe because we're all inside and the spread is easier. That would be my only guess. But other than that, I don't really know. Okay. Because it's definitely not spread outside, and the idea that it spreads better in the cold air kind of doesn't cut it. Maybe because, you know, in, a, in winter time it's warm, we turn on the heaters, they dry the air, maybe that facilitates the virus spread. Now, we have no treatment. There's no treatment for this virus. Okay? Um, and surprisingly, there's no vaccine. Oh my God. Hmm? Why not? I always wondered that. Well, I had a privilege to work right by. I didn't work with her, but uh, we had joint lab meetings. So, a woman, uh, Dr. Stephanie Karst, She's now in, at the University of Florida, Gainesville. She's one of the world leading experts in norovirus infection. And she actually, original, I told you, original norovirus was discovered about an hour drive from here, an hour and a half, Norwalk, Ohio. And it was called Norwalk virus until the folks from Norwalk sent a mail saying, can you please rename it? We kind of feel bad about a city. So, that original human virus, it doesn't infect mice. So there was no animal model. It was studied in people, like people got infected. And it was found that in humans, it doesn't cause long-lasting immunity. Does that make sense? So even though people get, like you can infect a person with a certain genotype, and as soon as six months later, this person would be susceptible to that same infection. Like like the one before never happened. Make sense? And then Dr. Karst, uh, while she was a postdoc at Washington University, she discovered a mouse norovirus. It was, it was like, you know, that's how opportunity presents itself. There was an outbreak of di mouse diarrhea. They started to check, you know, what's going on. Figured out it was mouse norovirus. Okay. Got a manuscript out of it. Great discovery. Great, fantastic model. Excellent model. The only difference, mice don't vomit. They don't have vomiting reflex. But they, you know, diarrhea, all that stuff, the cellular, <clears throat> the immune responses are the same. So, all good. And in mice, it was shown it doesn't cause protective long-term immune response. So basically, let's put it this way. Say we have a family <clears throat> and a father gets norovirus, okay? So this norovirus gets transmitted to spouse and then to children. They all get sick. Are they protected? For maybe two, three months, they are protected from that particular strain. So reinfection in the family is not going to happen. But if they're exposed to that same virus six months later, they're going to get infected again. We have no idea what the mechanism is. Zero. Nilch. Okay? So how bad this infection is in the United States? And I wanted to say something. Oh, yeah. Remind me, tell me the word IBD at the end. Okay? So how bad this infection Main cause of gastroenteritis in the United States. 20 million cases a year. That's a lot. Okay. 2 million outpatient visits. 400,000 ER. 
about 60,000 hospitalizations, usually elderly and children, dehydration, and hundreds of deaths. Okay. Now, you see, estimates are different. So that same dude, Hall, in 2012, he estimated that the cost was $2 billion. But I mean, it's not, it doesn't really matter. It's still a lot of money, you know, healthcare costs. And on top of that, we do not account for the lost wages and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, these are examples of pandemics. Okay. It shows you the hospitalizations and deaths. So you see during pandemic, it was like two, three hundred deaths. Okay. Quite a lot. Now, why I said IBD. So that same person, Dr. Stephanie Karst, they were looking at the effects of norovirus in mice. And they specifically looked at the effects of norovirus in germ-free mice, mice that do not have intestinal microbiome. These mice without intestinal microbes the intestines are, I mean, I don't want to say grossly disfigured, but there are anatomical abnormalities. Um, did you take AP2? Can I count? Yeah. I don't know if some of you did. And AP2, remember cecum? Cecum in the germ-free mice is four or five times bigger than the cecum in the conventional mice. It's so big sometimes. My wife had, a, she worked, when she worked with germ-free mice, she had experiences when she picks up a mouse that she knows is a male, and this male looks pregnant because of giant cecum inside, okay? So there is something wrong going on anatomically. You can see the, the cellular differences, the cytological differences. And Dr. Karst, and their lab, they did a very simple experiment. They took germ-free mice and infected them with norovirus. And it ameliorated all the pathology associated with being germ-free. And then they showed that norovirus infection ameliorated inflammatory bowel disease in germ-free mice. Like, reduced it. How? There is some immune modulation. It infects virus can infect B cells in the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. That was weird. You know, that was that was really weird. Maybe at some point it will project to, you know, helping people with IBD to not cure but reduce the symptoms. Okay. Now. That concludes a virus story, and we move on to protozoa. Now, the quiz that you will collect on your way out is only about viruses, okay? Now, regarding protozoa, so there are a lot of them. Now, what do we need to understand? What's common be between all protozoa? They all are eukaryotic, okay? They all have main organelles like mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, and so on, except chloroplasts. So protozoa are not photosynthetic. That makes sense. Single-celled organisms that have chloroplasts, we call them single-celled algae. Another important feature, they do not have a cell wall all of them. That's kind of a distinctive characteristic of a protozoa. You take single-celled yeasts, like, you know, single-celled fungi, like candida albicans. You look at the structure of the cell of candida albicans, it does have a cell wall. Am I clear? Protozoa do not have a cell wall. They do have two distinct layers, the cytoplasm. The ectoplasm, closer to the outside, is responsible for feeding, movement, and protection. The endoplasm is where the organelles are, okay? 
It's where the nucleus, food vacuole, contractile vacuole. Am I clear? Now, contractile vacuole is a really important organelle side of the protozoa because consider the environment these microorganisms exist in. Take amoeba. You see amoeba contractile vacuole right here in the center. Amoebic cells live in the water, mainly fresh water. So for amoeba, the environment is hypotonic. Are you with me? What's going to happen to a regular cell in the hypotonic environment? How will it change its size? Water will move which direction? Inside the cell. The cell is going to swell. If it's a bacterial cell or fungal cell, it's a less of a problem because those cells have cell walls. With a cell lacking the cell wall, it can lead to bursting. So, how do you deal with it? You're pumping the water out. In contractile vacuole, does just that. It pumps the incoming water out of the amoebic cell, for instance. Now, pumping doesn't require energy. Now, imagine that's your background process, like that's your boring Tuesday, pumping water out. So, you need a lot of ATP just to exist, just not to explode. This is why these microorganisms basically constantly on the prowl, you know. They're constantly on the hunt. They're constantly eating just to provide enough ATP for their existence. Am I clear? Now, the three forms that are shown here, the ciliated protozoa, also called ciliophore, the amoebic protozoa, sarcodina, and flagellated protozoa, mastigophora. They all can live independently in the non-parasitic fashion. We already talked about one such pathogen, which is amoeba nigleria fowleri, normally living in the pond water or soil, right? So it's not an obligate parasite. Does that make sense? But the vast majority of those microorganisms can go through two very distinct stages. One stage is active, live, replicating, feeding. This stage is called trophozoite. You can't just give it an acronym TZ because writing with a mouse is very awkward. Okay? Now, when environment becomes dangerous, nutrients are gone, competition is elevated, um, you know, water is absent, trophozoites form cysts, exactly. So they form cysts. Now that stage, that, that process, going from trophozoite to cyst, is called encystment. E-N-C-Y-S-T-M-E-N-T. -E Does that make sense? This process going from actively feeding, moving, replicating form to basically dormant, although extremely well protected form of cyst. Does it remind you of something? That bacteria do, huh? And the spores in bacteria. Same idea. So protozoan cysts are resistant to conventional, you know, disinfection methods. Does that make sense? Now, when environment becomes favorable again, cysts go through the process of excystment, becoming trophozoites. This 
you know, back and forth between trophozoites and cysts. We're all good, feeling confident about it. Now, trophozoites can obviously be infectious and are infectious. Like if you consume a, a giardia trophozoite, you're going to get giardiasis. Does that make sense? But what else can happen is you can consume giardia cyst, and it can be infectious too. So if you consume a cyst, it will become a trophozoite inside your guts, for instance. You understand what I'm saying? And it will cause the disease. For that Giardia story that I just mentioned, when people with Giardiasis poop it out, in feces you can actually observe both trophozoites and cysts. And these cysts found in the feces, can they be consumed by a person and, you know, cause the disease? Does that make sense? Now, the very last thing that I want to remind you, and we're going to wrap it up, is classification. Um, there are many types of classification. The one that we're going to be using here and now in this course is classification based on on the method of locomotion. The first type is sarcodina, it's amoebic cells, okay, like this Niglaria fowleri. Um, they form pseudopodia, move around. Got it? Second is mastigophora, the flagellated protozoa, like this Giardia lamblia. Many people, that's single Giardia cell, that's many Giardial cells. Many people consider Giardia to be the, the prettiest of all parasitic protozoans. It's almost, you know, I, I consider this a mustache. Now, obviously they use flagellum for movement. Ciliophora, like this Balantidium coli, and you saw paramecium here, those are ciliated protozoa, okay? Move it, movement because of this cilia. And finally, apicomplexa, or sporozoa, plasmodium, toxoplasma, those are non-moving microorganisms, and therefore obligate parasites. All apicomplexin protozoa are obligate parasitic microorganisms that they cannot survive in the environment. They entirely depend on the host. Make sense? Take plasmodium, toxoplasma, cryptosporidium, cyclospora, they're all parasitic. Okay? So, <clears throat> we're going to wrap it up at this point. On your way out, do not...